chemical engineering, all sort of like. Uh, but that's also why you're here, right? You're interested in that. So um, this event is also organized by these uh, PhD students from ETN Charming. But what is um, next? Come on. Yes, what is ETN Charming actually? So uh, ETN Charming is a, a European project funded by the European Union and the system of Marie, Marie Curie. And it actually stands for European Training Network for Chemical Engineering Immersive Learning. So if you look closely and squint your eyes, you can maybe find out some of these letters that are, that are charming. But yeah, that's the European Union and they love abbreviations. But um, yeah, so our project, uh, we have three main uh, factors and we do actually research on immersive learning. But what is immersive learning? In our case, it's like virtual reality, augmented reality and games. And we use those technology to actually support uh, chemistry and chemical engineering education. And that the three main factors that I said, one is being intersectorial. That means that we have uh, several universities, uh, very known and also big chemical companies working together actually to provide this kind of support of immersive learning for chemistry. So we have like Keo Leuven, Newcastle University, Arkema, Merck. So those are the big uh, chemical companies, BASF. And we're actually a research project with 15 other PhD students. And because you see all those uh, different um, universities and companies, the second main factor is also we're uh, very international. So we have PhD students from uh, from Belgium, Le from uh, Netherlands, Germany, Denmark, England, and France. So we're working all together internationally as well, within Europe at least. And uh, the second part is also the, second, the third main factor is also we're interdisciplinary because we are working with this kind of immersive technology for learning. We need to have uh, for chemistry and chemical engineering as well. So we have like these three kind of uh, disciplines that we need in this project, right? So the PhD students uh, and the universities are from these uh, three different domains, chemical engineering, educational science and computer science. So yeah, that's how we are uh, as in, as for Etienne Charming and we're with 15 PhD students, but they don't work everyone with same uh, same project, same thing, right? There are three main target groups and these target groups are split into population groups that we focus on. So the first uh, work, so let's say, works with children from primary school to start off the uh, secondary school and their objective is to motivate and also teach children uh, from a young age about chemistry education, so they're more motivated to study uh, later on in STEM education. And then second, work package works with students because chemical concepts and chemical engineering concepts can be quite abstract. So then we use immersive technology to actually educate them better with the active learning, with the kind of visuals. And then you have also third work package working with employees of the chemical industry and their target is to train employees to work their job safely um, and with emergence of technology you'll see there are lots of benefits um, to to have that and these are actually all the 15 PhD students and luckily we have um, for each work package someone who will speak uh, today this afternoon. So this is what our schedule will look like. So you have uh, three speakers, uh, Mikhail, Jessica and Pedro. They will speak for 15 minutes and then after that, after each presentation is five minutes of uh, Q&A. Then we have a short break after 15 minutes and then the other three uh, PhD students for 15 minutes and the Q&A after. And then at the end I will conclude and you can also try out the technology that we've built uh, in, the, in another room. You can try it like the AR, VR, you can try it yourself. But now we go to the first speaker, Michael Duman. Unfortunately, he's uh, sick uh, two days ago, so he cannot really present in person, but uh, he'll do it online then. So uh, I'll give the word to you, um, Michael. Michael. Yeah. I'll stop sharing. Yeah. 
me a second to share my screen. Okay. Can you is hear me? Can you see my presentation? Yeah, is there an echo for you? Do you hear your own voice? Mm, no, I don't. No. Okay. That's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. Um, my name is Michael Domin, and I will present you a custom made board game to familiarize primary school children with atoms um, as part of the Charming Project. Um, a little bit to my outline. Uh, so, firstly, I will uh, introduce you to some theoretical background, which led me to design and yeah, to approach um, a board to make a board game. Then I will present the board game itself um, in its essence, and after that, I will, um, yeah, introduce you to how to to design educational games um, and what were my essential steps in that design process. And I will finish with yeah, asking, is it enjoyable? And I will give a short overview of the study which we will approach. Yeah. Um, so here you can see some elements of the game. Um, it's a board with different rooms where players move with their tiles and they are several other elements of the game, which I will mention later. Um, but the first question which arises, of course, is, well, why a board game with atoms and why for children? Because um, atoms, of course, is a fairly, it's a fairly abstract concept and it's not being taught to children of primary school usually. So why that? Um, so here on the left side, actually, can you see my mouse? On the left side, you can see, ah, no, here on the left side, you can see a picture of a water molecule. And on, in the middle, we see apparently several flasks where some bubbling is going on. And uh, I assume some chemical reactions are going on there. Um, but, well, if you think about it, what is a chemical reaction? And essentially, it's a rearrangement of atoms, right, uh, in the microscopic scale. Um, so there is an argument uh, between some educators who argue um, that, yeah, we should teach um, basic concepts of atoms so that we can make more meaningful explanations for other concepts within chemistry education. Um, and yeah, um, but of course this is this is very unorthodox and it's it's highly debated. Um, due to the abstract nature of atoms and because you cannot see and touch them right, especially for children, this is um, yeah, hard to believe. But um, with the right teaching methods, um, we believe this is possible. Um, so now a short, um, 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 some, some aspects of, of the cognitive um, background. So um, what children of late primary school usually possess already as a, as what is called a mental model, a compositional mental model. That means that a child can already accept that, let's assume you have a, um, a piece of wood, and if you divide that piece into sm smaller pieces, then certain properties of that big piece are overtaken to the small one. For example, um, it is still wood, it is still flammable. Of course, the size and the volume changed, um, but yeah, this property is overtaken and you can continue this process to a certain limit where you where they say well now we cannot divide it further because well it's too small right it's it's just too small to do it um so maybe there, there's a sort of end to it and um you want to progress from this this sort of mental state to a so-called particulate mental model where in this example here a diamond is consisted of um yeah, well, atoms as they are in, in this crystal structure here, um, and that you accept that this is the basic building block of materials. Um, yeah. Um, and, and this transition um, is argued to happen at the end of primary school, if you have the right teaching methods. Um, so, what I did in my project, um, before I designed the game um, is I administered um, a small task to children of late primary school and I presented them these five materials. 
um, a foam, a piece of wood, a piece of Teflon, uh, a brick and a piece of steel. And I simply ask them, um, well, what are these materials and can you order them from hard to soft? Um, and what the children uh, then usually do is they order the, the steel and the, the brick sort of on the hard side and the foam and the wood sort of on the uh, soft side. And the the position of this Teflon piece is varying because, yeah, they don't really know this material, right? It's a very, very uncommon material. But the other ones are a part of their daily life and they're, they know them and they have an intuitive notion of, well, what is harder than the other? Um, so that's good already, um, but if you then sort of push them to explain, well, why is this particular order? They usually cannot give a meaningful explanation to this. What they essentially say is that, well, it's steel, so it's hard. Um, it's it, Because it is steel, it is hard. Um, so this is where we sort of want to provide a more meaningful explanation to, to have, making this order. Um, so now that uh, we know that they have an intuitive notion of hardness, we have to shortly again um, say, well, what is hardness? In material sciences, this is of course a very complex phenomenon. There are very different ways of measuring hardness, like Brinell hardness, um, Mohs scale, and I forgot the other names. Um, it's not an it, it's a complex phenomenon, but basically, still you can say, well. Macroscopic hardness is generally characterized by strong intermolecular bonds, uh, but the behavior of solid materials on the force is very complex. And based on this idea, um, we formulated um, the goal of the game, um, the educational goal of the game is right, we, we want them to learn something. Um, we want them to make a sort of switch in their conceptual thinking that atoms are indeed invisible building blocks of macroscopic objects and the strength, the strength of uh, the interactions between atoms um, result in different degrees of hardness. Um, yeah, so it's, it's a conceptual goal. I don't want to teach factual knowledge of atoms. For example, that whatever they are composed of protons, neutrons and electrons, this is factual knowledge. We have a conceptual approach of teaching. So this is the game. I call it uh, Material Monsters. Um, unfortunately, you will not be able to play it in person as I'm not here, um, but here you can see it. It's a cooperative board game uh, for two to four players. And the goal of the game is um, to succeed or to pass as many challenges as possible within a certain time, namely seven rounds of the game. And the challenges are, yeah, they are events which are related to hardness. So, for example, on the bottom right side, you see um, a monster which uh, uh, an anvil is falling on top of the monster. And um, yeah, it has to resist that challenge. And the basic mechanism to, um, yeah, win or not win a challenge works as follows. Um, in different rooms where you step with your figure uh, on the main board, um, you first scan and you flip the monster tiles and then you install different uh, atoms here, these round tiles and bonds, the, the sort of long tiles. And then you attempt a challenge and the challenges are resolved by throwing two um, categories of dice one for atoms and one for bonds. And which atom dies and which bond dies you can choose depends on which um, atoms and bonds did you install into the monster. And they have a different, well, average value they throw. Um, so the blue one rolls very low, the red one very high, and similarly for thin and thick bonds. And if you match uh, or if you meet the, the indicated value for a challenge, well, you pass it or you don't. That's the basic idea, essentially how I incorporated the educational goal into a game, which is hopefully also fun. Um, now uh, I wanted to give you some idea on how I designed this, this game and how I made it, because you can certainly say within educational games, there's a sort of innate difficulty to balance. Yeah, well, the education value and the fun value. Um, usually these are concepts which are colliding, um, but it is possible to achieve both. 
And um, I, for me, the leading idea for this was um, a concept which is called intrinsic integration. This basically means that the learning content must be embodied within the most fun elements of the game and the structure of the gaming world and the player's interaction with it. So the player really has to yeah, use it as a main game mechanic within the game so that you can ensure um, the player has some takeaway of it. And I combined this leading design idea with four other design criteria, namely cooperation, communication, strategy, and a playtime between 20 and 30 minutes. Um, these design criteria were basically set to ensure that throughout the game, um, well, there's a sort of meaningful interaction. There are meaningful conversations about the learning content, which is embodied in the main game mechanics of the game. And particularly um, 20 to 30 minutes playtime um, for us was a criterion because we want to be able to put it into a school lesson, right? Um, with maybe having a, re a reflection session with the teacher uh, talking to the children afterwards. So this is how we achieve or hopefully achieve learning and fun. Um, but of course, there's also another dimension towards the design process um, because, well, now we know theoretically what do we want, right? Um, but how do we make a board game? This is still a, a open question. And what worked there for me was simply to screen uh, available commercial non-educational games, which are already, well, um, known within the community and they are known to be fun and the most impactful games um, for my uh, own creation was uh, on the left side here Forbidden Island and on the right side Five Minute Dungeon. Um, for Forbidden Island there is a very similar concept um, in, in the way that okay the board is composed of different tiles and the players move use movements um, to move from tile to tile and they have certain actions they can do um, yeah, within their turn to achieve a bigger collaborative goal, which is in Forbidden Island gathering treasures in my game, passing challenges. And Five Minute Dungeon mainly uh, inspired the game in terms of yeah the design that we wanted to have some artificial creatures which sort of look uh, child friendly, right? Because we don't want um, yeah we want we want a child friendly game. Um, yeah, so uh, is the game enjoyable? Um, we already conducted a pilot test with uh, children, I think seven children in total. And what they usually refer to, what is fun, um, except if they say something very general, they say, okay, I find it fun, interesting. Um, but if they first refer to something more specifically, they, they, they like this sort of balance between um, planning and strategy and luck because Eventually, you have to roll a dice to succeed or to pass a challenge. Um, and this is, yeah, this is a luck element um, in board games. But of course, what dice you can choose, this is dependent on what atoms and bond you choose to, to, to attempt the challenge. So um, yeah, this, this um, balance seemed to work out for us. And also for, for students who, who played the game in, in, yeah, throughout the design process in intermediate versions, they also refer to this um, rather often. Um, yeah. And yeah, one boy, for example, he particularly liked that. Yeah, this, this sort of constructing mechanic, you, you have a tile and you fit it into another one and then you have a construct of three tiles which fit into each other. This I think this this um, sort of speaks to the the inherent builder and constructor of, of some children. OK. Um, shortly to my study, which is um, ongoing. So um, as I mentioned, um, what we want to achieve and what we want to measure with the game is, well, did they start, do they start to think differently? Is there a sort of change in their, their conceptual thinking? This is the first main goal of the, of the, of the study. And is, is it still interesting? Uh, can we, can we measure that? And we want to do this uh, in a, in a, yeah, sort of the, the study design works with uh, pre-interviews and post-interviews and retention interviews to make sure that, well, they remember or, or don't remember uh, uh, some aspects of the game even after a long period um, and not just, well, 10 minutes after playing the game, right? Um, looking at the time, I have to finish and I think I'm quite on time. These are some of my references. 
And yeah, thank you so much for your kind attention and feel free to uh, ask some questions. Hello. Yes. Can you hear me, Michael? Yes. Yes, thank you for your nice presentation. Uh, does anyone have a question for Michael? Hello, Michael. I'm Chris Keres uh, from Education uh, Chemistry. Hi. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello. hello. <laughs> I um, I have some questions for you. Um, for instance, you say that um, point uh, uh, for first point, if you need some schools, you can contact me. I have some schools. Oh, that which is very maybe good. can help you, <laughs> so you can always contact me. But um, you say something about reflection uh, afterwards mm -hmm. with the teacher. Yes. How do you, um, I mean, the teachers at the primary school, they don't know exactly that much about chemistry anymore. How do you yes. help them to give the right answers? Um, essentially by providing uh, a manual with what are the intended learning goals for us and how do you, yeah, how do you discuss with them, with the children about this? And I mean, this is this is very basic. We, um, you, you don't need factual knowledge of chemistry about this. Uh, as I mentioned, the concept of hardness, it, you can break it down to, well, it's a concept which is called molecules and atoms, and they are sort of connected to each other. And the quality of this connection, this is all what matters. And if you already man make this step in primary school, we think this is, yeah, this is a, a good achievement. And by providing simply a manual with also the background in a, yeah, understandable written way, uh, we hope that that uh, a teacher can can also talk about talk about it with some children. Primary yeah. school teacher. Yeah, I suppose yes, she should be uh, helping him or her. Um, yes. Don't don't you think there might be a problem with uh, uh, making misconceptions? Yes, um, yes. This is actually the the main reason or the main uh, critical point for science educators is well do you create misconceptions or not and in science education as far as i can see there are certain well let's say intermediate steps to achieve a very sophisticated idea of the atomic structure and some intermediate steps are um, they they help you to progress to more advanced more sophisticated models and some intermediate steps they they tend to be very entrenched and the student cannot really um, progress from this idea to having another idea about atoms and this argument i used as a uh, actually you can see it here this argument i used as a final decision to actually design the atoms and the bond tiles exactly like that um, in a previous version the atoms they they looked like a small piece of the same material it's representing. Um, I had what I had. I had sponge, stone, and steel, and then you simply had small tiles of sponge, stone, and steel. Um, but having them as a yeah abstract, they they just have a color, and there are just different qualities towards having the bonds, uh, different capacities of of having different bonds. Um, yeah, we believe that this helps to progress further if you have then real chemistry education later in primary school and in secondary school. And after all, right, if you if you look at these three dimensional models to make whatever organic molecules, they usually are also they're just balls and sticks and they have different colors, right? And yeah, they have also different capacities to make bonds or not. So yeah, this is this is the basic idea behind this. Does this answer your question? Uh, yes, he says yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. So thank you, Michael. Uh, then we go next to our speaker, Jessica. Um, you can share your screen then. Uh, yeah, you can just share it now. And also, Okay. Thank you so much. Great. 
This is new, this is new. Can you see the presentation now? All right. I'll keep here if you are OK, because I will use the phone later. Um, can you see it? Yeah. All right. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the chemistry afternoon. Uh, my name is Jessica Dominguez, and today I will also share another novel tool that we have created in Charming to train uh, and motivate learners in uh, training chemical practical skills. I think it's not. It's not changing weight. Mm. Let me see. Yeah, you don't see the screen sharing just the No, but it's sharing, no? Sharing the PowerPoint application with the same. Okay, let me try. Yeah, this is. Okay. <coughs> yes. All right. So, how many of you are familiar with um, maybe playing or seeing at least, or even uh, are addicted to uh, catching Pokemons everywhere? <laughs> Yes, all right, good, good. <laughs> well, Pokemon Go is a very good example of augmented reality. It's actually probably the most popular one. Uh, but today I will share with you that augmented reality can actually be much more than that and is actually being used in much more uh, yeah, ways. So I will give you a, just the very basics of uh, what augmented reality is, uh, its characteristics. Uh, some examples where the technology is being used, and I will give you a, a, yeah, a demo of the application uh, I developed and some insights on the user studies uh, and what we learned from it. So augmented reality, it's a, a technology that allows to combine, align and interact with digital content or virtual content on real time. Uh, and it's being used in different domains, for example, in the medical domain or in medical context. Uh, doctors uh, contextualize their, the patients with medical data uh, during the operations. Or also in manufacturing sites, they use it to augment uh, with the relevant information for the process. Or in the assembly lines, they also use the augmentation to help them proceed in a more efficient way. But also, we there are some examples in education and even in chemical education. So there are already applications if you are curious uh, to visualize molecules, so you can augment your molecule if you're t uh, teaching or if you are teaching a reaction, there is also augmentation on how the, the mechanism of the reaction works. There are also some teachers that already done this application, which is very interesting to augment when they are in the lab, augmented the a video in, in front of the machine so the students know how it works from inside. Uh, and it's, it's yeah, more and more applications are getting there. But most of them are uh, developed for visualization. So just to visualize some videos, uh, etc. But there is al already evidence that using the technology can be actually very motivating for students. And with the combination with the devices, with the tablets or also with the phones, it is accessible and scalable for students. So what we want to do in this project is to explore how do the students uh, learn an experiment, specifically a titration experiment with an interactive AR application. So it's a little bit more than visualization, so they can interact with the elements in the lab. And now I will do the demo. This I hope the technical, the technical things allow me to do it. Can you still see my screen? Maybe I will just to not overwhelm you with the screens that I have. Let's see. Okay, so I have my phone here and 
So the application is called MARLAB, and MARLAB stands for Model Augmented Reality, but also you will see uh, that the... Uh, can you give access? Yeah, okay. To the, okay, let me try again. Yes, so it's mobile augmented reality and also Marie Curie is the expert that helps the students along the experiment. So I will try to show you and maybe later if you are interested, you can also play a little bit with the application. Let me just take this out. Um, OK, so the idea is uh, that the students get a problem and they have to uh, make a different titrations in order to find out which vinegar has the higher concentration. I'll just go through the instructions so you don't need to read that. Uh, and then uh, they go through the, through the levels. As in the lab, they have to know what they will do. And it's important we also tell them you have to wear protective equipment. Uh, we take it seriously. <laughs> um, OK, and now you will see my screen. I hope it's not lagging a lot in the in the call. So you well with the phone we register the area and then it recognizes the surface. It's a bit messy because of the computers, but hopefully you see. So here is Marie Curie. She tells, okay, we can start. And we have all the elements as you can see. We can go to the logbook and see the instructions that they have to do. There are also some messages that we use in order to provide important messages in different parts of the procedure. And now we can. Now you imagine that you have the, the lab coat and the glasses. So what they have to do is just assemble all the materials and perform the titration. And in the end, they can see here the reaction and all the steps and here they can follow how the titration curve is formed. I would just take some, otherwise it would take very long, but you can play afterwards if you want. So as you can see in the screen, maybe I will slow it down so it's not super fast. With the buttons that are in the, in the, in the screen, you can grab objects and you can interact with them. You can rotate and and there is also a second button in which you can open information. For example, we can go to this and we can see the content. So I will not perform the titration because otherwise it will take too long. But if you are interested in the demo session, I can share with you the application. Um, OK. So as you saw, uh, well, our intention with the application is to provide a holistic experience of what they do in the lab. So to try how it feels and what do they have to do. Uh, and But by no means we aim to have this application replacing the real labs. And well, according to uh, the meaningful learning theory created by Joseph Novak, which is very famous in chemical education, uh, he says that learning experiences must be designed uh, in order to integrate uh, thoughts, actions, and feelings. And he called it affective domain, cognitive domain, and psychomotor domain. So, for example, if we want to teach uh, acid-base theory in the theoretical courses, they will get the concepts, and then they go to the lab, and they, uh, yeah, they cover the psychomotor domain there. They uh, train the dexterity and precision. And if the content in the in the experiment is related to something that they know from daily life, they will be more motivated and construct a more solid knowledge to use it later on. So the, with this theory, uh, what we want to, um, yeah, to how we designed the application was with the idea to support the psychomotor domain. So we know that there are some people uh, in different curricula that they don't go to the laboratory. For example, in KU Leuven, chemical engineering students normally don't go early in their careers to to the laboratory, they go later, but maybe from the beginning we can support there. And from the chemistry students, they do have laboratories, 
so that the application or these types of application can help them to support maybe before going to the lab. So this is the idea and why we want to create it. And we have performed different studies. Actually, I make it very simple, but we can discuss it later on. Um, and in order to, to see if actually they can use it and if it's not too uh, complicated, how the interaction works, etc. And during these studies, we have asked how usable is the application, what we can improve, and how does the user interact with the application in general. So we look into very specific uh, interactions. And from the studies, what we have learned, we, we have done four uh, iterations of the prototype. Uh, we start with one level only, and then we improved until, um, until the current version over four, four experiments. And what we learned from these four experiments, uh, with the current version that we have, uh, the usability it's uh, considered to be good, which means that they can usually they can use the application independently, so they don't require too much help, and the, they are not major problems, so they can actually go through the levels and finish, uh, yeah, the whole the whole experience. Uh, one thing is uh, we learned uh, from, yeah, how can I say this like harsh. <laughs> is that the having the application in their native language was very important because the first uh, the first experiment we had the the application in english and we tried it with uh, dutch speakers and they really had uh, problems because they were trying to translate in their heads what was going on and it was not the, that they didn't know english it was just too much going on because the technology is still very new for them so now we learned that and uh, we translate the application into the native language. And so we have it in Dutch and in German. We make some experiments with uh, students that never have, have uh, experience in, the in titration or in the lab very limited. And we saw that they can actually uh, learn the basics of the procedure. It's really hard to, to tell that they learned a lot because it's a very simple study but at least we have some uh, evidence that they, they can learn. And with the experts, so the students that already have had titration before, uh, at least from their feedback and also from their results, um, they say that it's nice for them to train some aspects and maybe studied, study again the procedure after they have learned it, I don't know, two years ago. So it can be a, a tool for restudying the concept. Uh, with everything, one, some of the challenges that we still have, and this is not uh, directly linked to the design of the application, it's still limitations from the technology itself. It's One is the compatibility of the devices, so um, not all the students have these high-end phones that can handle this AR technology, and this is a, a, a very big drawback because it limits the scalability, which, uh, which we hope that in some years, everybody, even if, if the phone is cheap, they can access to the, the software. Um, the AR tracking, uh, well, you, don't, you didn't saw it here because it is a messy table, so it was actually easy to track, but it's still not uh, robust enough. So if you track a very, um, yeah, for example, a white table, it takes long. And this creates a lot of frustration for students because then the, the equipment floats and they cannot continue. and and this is uh, something that is still uh, on their development. And the last one is this, the smartphone really gets hot. Uh, if you have tried Pokemon and this, my application, it's really, it's really impressive. Your phone gets very warm, your battery goes down. And this is, yeah, you don't want to have that kind of application in your phone. It crashes and sometimes uh, it lags uh, on, in the experience. And this is also not very, not very, um, yeah, it's frustrating for, for, for them. So yeah, this is the reality. So hopefully uh, there is some development there in the technical part, which I am not working directly, but I hope in the future the phones are more uh, compatible with the technology. So hopefully we will release the application soon. Uh, we plan it to do it in October, November of next year, like the public version. Um, from the last iteration, I will fix some of the problems and hopefully it will be available for free. 
um, people can use it and use it in their courses and everybody has access. So that's the idea and also it's part of our aims in the European project. And hopefully, maybe one day instead of the Pokemon Fest, all the students go and study chemistry but instead of uh, catching Pokemons that everybody is using this, these types of applications. And with this, I would like to thank you and I would be happy to answer your questions. All right, thank you, Jessica, for this nice presentation and your AR lab. So uh, anyone questions for Jessica? Yeah. Looks very nice. How long does it actually take to design one such experiment? Um, if you're like me, you know, I'm a chemist um, and I didn't know how to program when I started the PhD and I learned everything from scratch. So I've been in the project two years and a half. Yeah, but I'm full time doing this, you know, okay. uh, and I have some computer scientists also helping me um, that the framework. So how the buttons you saw in the screen that I didn't design myself completely so th that I am collaborating in Germany with the, one of the the universities and they create this already. The good news is that uh, this year, I think it's already available. There is a framework when you can create the, the scenarios yourself. And they are creating this because that's one of the most interesting parts, the authoring tool that the teachers or somebody that has, you know, some at least some interest in technology can do it themselves. Otherwise, one to create a, one application, one standalone, it's not so interesting anymore. So the short answer is if you're super interested, you can do it uh, with this new um, authoring tool. Probably it will be faster. Uh, but yeah, you can do a PhD two, three. <laughs> Another question because I will not spend two years, but but like if you have this, can you kind of alter it? If, uh, like uh, change the, the the research question a little bit or does that take a whole redesign? You, you mean in the lab? Yeah, yeah uh, the, 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 the application, is it modular in some way that you as a teacher, you could kind of modify the question, like instead of just comparing two solutions of vinegar, Yep. go to something else this is probably something that i will try to do for the uh, before publishing it so there is one level that is still there and this is one part that i would like to do so if you are a teacher if you want to do a specific experiment you can do it so because the the simulator so how the titration is calculated inside the application it's standard so you just choose the the concentration and the acid or base and hopefully that is possible so that's uh, something i will add um but if you download the application like now, you will not be able to change. Okay. Uh, yeah. Once you have a few basic mechanics in place, you can probably make very complex yeah, assignments. Yeah, and this is really just a case study. So the the dream would be to have a lab that you can just put and design different experiments. So this is what I will try to do later, but it 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 takes uh, some time. And with the outer tool, I'm pretty sure that that will really be faster. So I will hopefully try it now and see how it goes. Okay, um, good. good luck with that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Right, anyone else questions? Uh, yeah, the girl there was first. <laughs> uh, it's very nice presentation. So I wonder that if, uh, for example, like um, if we have a reaction, so how we can uh, describe like you you already know about the phenomenon or how it will be going uh, or how it will go so you will design it or how you can you mean that the reaction inside the application? yes because yes for example like now you just uh, titration uh, curve so it's easy one but for more commonly uh, get it one like the reactions with uh, many um, uh, many things can happen so how you can yeah, so this is a, indeed an abstracted version. So the first level is just simple titration. And then the second and the third level, it's weak acid, strong base. So it's a little bit more complicated, but we don't have, at least in this version, the yeah the more complicated titrations with more than one PKAs, etc. Uh, so if you want to use this, probably you will have already a, an activity in your classroom designed with the same reactions or at least the same concepts. And then you can you can use it as such, but it's not possible now to to change the reactions. Probably, yeah, that's a good addition maybe for the last level. But yeah. Okay, one more question then from this, sir. 
Thank you. Um, I'm Peter, I'm an equational developer, and I tested it last year. Okay. And I was wondering, what is the level of frustration? Because I was using the app. Yeah. With a, my desk was made of glass. Yeah. My battery ran flat, even warm. Yeah. So what is the level of frustration and the level of dropout during the experiment of the individuals? So I can share the last experience. So we tested with 37 K-11 students and we saw four people saying, I, I don't want to continue. I need to leave the room. So that can give you a, but I, I was there. So this is something that we still not sure because it's an experimental setting. So you are there, you're looking at them and they think oh, I need to finish this. All my colleagues are also doing it. So it's just an idea probably to see the real dropout. You will have to do it at home and then we can see and measure. But I don't have these numbers. But in the experimental setting, four persons told me I, I can't, I need to go. So that's <laughs> it's like maybe 10 percent of them. They really, really didn't didn't. Uh, they were, you know, very. OK, that's very quite interesting. I want to hear that as well. <laughs> All right. OK, Thank on, you to the, on to the next speaker. Uh, that will be Pedro. Oh, yeah, <laughs> Pedro with his presentation. Can you unshare um, yours? Yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, uh, I hope that you will find my presentation at least uh, a bit engaging. Uh, it's titled Active Learning with Games, a prototype for Raoul's Law, but it's really a bit about uh, the whole of my PhD. So there's some other aspects in between. Uh, I will explain as I go. So first, uh, first question, who am I? I some introduction. So my name is, of course, Pedro Santos. I'm a chemical engineer. I'm from Valladolid. Uh, probably most of you don't know Valladolid. Maybe some of you do, because it's the football club is sometimes in first league, sometimes in second league, depends on which year you check. It's right there around the middle. And here you have some pictures. So I, I, I decided, OK, let's push some tourism. You know, let's try to. It's not the most touristic area of Spain. So if you want to practice your Spanish, it's an ideal location. Really, you go to the bar, they will not uh, serve you in English. This, this is not an option. So a really good place to practice Spanish, and that's where I'm from. You see that we have some old buildings, some uh, second 1.5 league club. And of course, I'm an ESR in the Charming project. And uh, when I started, of course, I had a, a project, right? Each ESR has a certain project, and in my case, it was integrated integrating process simulations with uh, with games and developing some prototypes in that direction. So it was mostly a technical uh, project of how to deal with this project uh, with these process simulators. I don't know if any of you work with chemical process simulators. If, if you do raise your hand, Aspen High, is Aspen Plus, all these things. OK, that's good because I, I almost I skip this part a lot <laughs> because I it's not so in theme. So I will focus on the on the prototype that I developed. But just a, a quick overview for those who are interested, maybe someone in the in the online audience. So this is a, a process simulator. As you can see, it has many. Does this have a light? No. Well, it has many parts, uh, and this represents a chemical plant. And uh, I think one of the questions already touched on that. Uh, Wait, sorry. So one of the questions already was about different titration. Uh, what if you use different products? This is one of the big challenges of developing uh, a simulation about so an, an educational game about chemistry or something like this. Uh, of course, if you develop it in a game engine, there are no chemical models, right? So normally what people do, what I think what everyone else did is just program every event by hand. So you can say, OK, when I introduce this liquid, this happens. When I introduce this other liquid, this happens. But if you want to represent a more complicated process, then you can start spending a lot of time if you have to in, if you have to program how everything interacts with everything else. And then at some point you say, well, it might be more worth it to just 
take a, uh, a simulation that dynamically creates the interactions through using chemical models. Uh, but the problem is that making such a simulation is, is a very time expensive uh, resource. There's, there's companies that uh, really focus on this and they charge a lot of money <laughs> to use this simulator. So, so what we thought or what, what, what was thought, you know, the reason why my project was about this is, okay, how can we use this? Um, how can we use them as databases or as engines for processing? Um, and I studied some of the approaches and I will just go very fast. If nobody's familiar with this, it will not be very interesting. But essentially, there's a there's a approach which is called OPC. That is the one that they use in industry. This is developed, but it doesn't allow you a, a lot of functionality. So I focused on two alternatives. The first one was ActiveX, which uh, can interact directly, but it had problems when you compile it because of the way it exchanged data. And then I also looked into more uh, a meta modeling approach, or you can call it a machine learning approach where I use active learning to try to get a representative sample from the simulation and then insert that into the game. Of course, the advantage if you do that is now it's inside the game, so you can just uh, use the game normally. You don't even have to run the simulation at all, right? You don't have to have any license or anything. Uh, the problem is it's not so easy to do as I discovered as I got more into it and uh, that it only works for the things that you have done already, so you cannot change it dynamically. But okay, the, the game prototype. So when I said, okay, let's let's develop a game prototype, let's try to use a simulation, simple simulation for something, uh, I thought, well, let's look for the guidelines that exist, right? I saw books like this, you know, the names are very tempting, design and implementation in educational games, learning education and games. You would think, well, you, you will have some good guidelines here. This is not the case. Uh, these things are fake. They're not actual books. They are just articles put every person writes a, a para, like a chapter and then it's just 20 chapters which are completely completely unconnected and there's no guidelines this this it doesn't teach you at all how to design case or I mean it's definitely not what I expect uh, I guess it's good if you are a researcher in in these fields and you want to get up to speed in the latest uh, developments but I couldn't find any guidelines for educational games that's the truth. And I myself, I'm not a pedagogian. Uh, so I said, well, okay, I'm an engineer. You know, if I cannot find some, I'll just make them. <laughs> so if I cannot find them in this, okay, maybe I can find them. Oh, well, uh, just to mention, there are some, of course, it's not like the field doesn't exist. There are some studies of, well, some parameters that are studied in this uh, meta analysis of what, uh, you know, where we saw best performance, but it's very few parameters. And you have a lot of guidelines for just normal game design. There you can really find as much as you want. Uh, but for educational game design, I, I definitely have a lot of challenges. So I said, okay, well, if, if not in educational games, uh, if not in games, well, let, let's just about look in education in general, right? Um, not my field, but let's see. And and I chose active learning. It's an approach that's very popular now. It's the one that K11, when you go as a PhD student and you have to get a mandatory training on how to teach uh, as a teacher assistant. This is the one they teach you. So I decided to to go with this, you know, active learning games are pretty active. And it's focused on the idea that, you know, have the students do exercises, do projects, uh, have and them engage actively with the subject. I thought well, this fits naturally with games. So I focused on this game. I got some guidelines from this, right? I read it. I read uh, this game, this book, sorry. Um, I read it, I compiled some guidelines from it that naturally fit into game design. And then I use them to create a test game. Uh, and I will give you a few seconds to look over and read them because I think it's faster if you just check them than if I go one by one. And that's enough. If you didn't read all of them, it's not uh, it's not important. Just so you could get an idea of the kinds of uh, guidelines that I extracted. And then I had to focus on a topic. And um, these process simulators, the thing they are best at is vapor liquid equilibrium. So really, this is their biggest strength. Um, 
uh, phase equilibrium with three components, azeotropes, all of these, they have all the models for this. They're not so good for chemical reactions. So I said, well, let's focus on vapor liquid equilibrium, what's called Raoult's law, is the simplest case. And uh, this is a topic that's very theoretical, and it didn't naturally fit into a 3D environment, right? So if you're, if you're teaching uh, students how to use an experimental setup, it makes a lot of sense to use augmented reality, virtual reality. If you're teaching them computational fluid dynamics, makes a lot of sense because this is very geometrical. You can really see the vortices or in the case of the laboratory, you can really grab a thing. With vapor liquid equilibrium, there's, and maybe this is one of the reasons why it's so unintuitive, there's no good visualization. You could visualize it as the molecules interacting, but that doesn't really, it, it's, a, it's more of a pattern of phases interacting. So there, there's no easy visualization. There's some charts, but they are 2D because you couldn't understand, like if you saw them in 3D, you, you, they wouldn't really be very understandable. So I focused on just using uh, 2D, so just a simple game, uh, just for computer. And uh, I decided on three mechanics based on the guidelines that I got. Uh, there's the simulation that the student can interact with. Then there's some tasks, some missions that we give the student so that they interact with the simulation. So we tell them, okay, you have this machine, study the temperature at this uh, pressure and stuff like this. And then we have some questions that we give them, which are focused on evaluating them. So to make sure that they are learning, the only way to get these questions correctly is to actually learn. So during this, when they get the second type of question, they don't have the chance to go back to the simulation and experiment. They have to solve it in the moment. So they have to have gather enough data to compare it. Uh, when I play the game, I think it, it resembles a lot uh, working in the lab in that sense, because it, it really you have to write down your results, otherwise you will just simply you will fail. So this is the prototype, so you can see it's very simple, it just uh, 2D is pixel art. I, I like this kind of art, so I thought, why not? And we tested it with some students, uh, with 11 students, I don't mention it here, but I think it might be interesting that of 11 students, nine liked it and two didn't like it and they said they just didn't understand what they were supposed to do so that was the ratio uh, i did it in unity uh, it's in webgl that means you can use it in any browser but for now it's only for pc but i will change it so that it's also possible with phone and this final testing pending so if any of you are professors in any subject that is related to this just send me a mail if you want to test it with your students. And thank you very much for your time. That's the end, and I left here some QR codes. If anyone is interested in any of the three aspects, you can uh, get either the article, uh, the article or the, the game itself to play it. And that's all, thank you very much for your time. And if anyone has any questions. Yeah, does anyone has a question? No Let's questions. Give a few seconds, maybe they're making pictures. I I think I have a question. Oh, okay. Uh, you right. can tell us how you play it. What what kind of things that you change or? Ah, yeah. You just uh, showed the picture, but the, how does the game? So it play? yeah, it it works. Uh, well, I don't want to move this because uh, <laughs> I, I would I would rather wait that everyone makes the the picture. So you saw the game, it's, it looks like, you know, like Pokemon or something like this, but the standard Pokemon, not the, not the augmented reality one. Yeah, you can just move around and you can interact with the objects. And some of the objects are telephones, right? So they will, you are called from the laboratory of atmospheric research or whatever, made up names. And then they tell you, well, you know, we're trying to study the evaporation in this lake and we are sending um, a probe and we want to know if we should expect evaporation or not, it has this pressure and this temperature. So those are the kind of missions where you then will experiment with your machine to see, okay, at these conditions, will I have vapor or not? And then you have the, the evaluation questions, right? The ones that are forcing you to actually take notes and, and learn, because not only do you have to take notes, but you have to predict what will happen later. And for those questions, then you get asked, indeed very similar questions, but there you don't have the chance to experiment with the machine, so you have to answer correctly in the moment. 
and otherwise you fail. People are not very fond of the of the evaluation questions. Everyone likes the 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 exploration questions because you can never fail them, right? So it, that's very nice. Uh, but of course, you don't learn. You just go and you go to the temperature and the pressure. Okay, next question. And then oh, I got all the money, right? Not very. So of course, uh, in this case, the learning requires a certain level of effort. Uh, it would be great if I could eliminate that, but uh, I I don't know how. So yeah. Any other questions? Oh yeah, um, yeah. What what's one of them? I'll I'll read read it out loud. I have a question of from Mikhail. Yes. Yeah, maybe you can unmute cool. yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I have a question. Um, Regarding your guidelines, um, 17 guidelines um, for the active learning, implementing them in, into games. I think the second one was inform your students about the learning objective. Yes. Um, and I find it a bit surprising. Can you can you explain that one? Yeah, so I just compiled the guidelines. I didn't test them. That means this is a guideline that is given for classrooms. And the idea yeah. is if you teach your student about your learning goals, if you tell them this is what I want you to learn, it will be easier for them to learn it because they won't know what they have to focus on. Mm -hmm. It's possible that if if you want the student to be very immersed in the game, then you don't want them to know about the learning objective or you don't want them to think about it because you want them just to play the game. It's also possible that it's still a good guideline. Uh, I don't know. I just got the ones that worked for classrooms and that I consider they can be implemented into the design of a game. So clearly in the design of a game, you can tell your students about the learning objectives. So that's why it's there. I think this one and another one, which is do not like avoid putting time pressure in the student. Those are the two more questionable ones for games because it has been shown, for example, that in games, time pressure can create uh, more flow. So it's uh, it, it might be that uh, that these ones are not so good, or it might be that others are not so good, right? But mm, yeah. I mean, I needed some guidelines. I, I, I also, I'm not an expert in the topic, so I, I did, I did what I could. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, it makes sense, right? Because if if you say this is, comes from a classroom context, um, yeah. Well, in a in a classroom, a student learns that what he knows, he will be tested on, right? So. Yeah. 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 It, it also, but it's also the point that the student. Uh, it's hard for a student, to, so it's very hard as a teacher to put yourself in the place of the student because the student doesn't have any knowledge. They don't know what's important, right? So they yeah. don't know what they should focus on studying. Uh, but of course, you know, as a teacher, it can also yeah. happen very easily that you start giving material that it's not necessary, but that you think it's interesting. But to the student, he cannot distinguish, is this just interesting facts or is this actually important and I should know. Yeah. So the, I, the guideline is good for for games for for classrooms, but for games it's all, it's an open question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. No, thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Pedro, for your presentation. Now it's uh, sort of two forty. Then we can go into a break for uh, let's say twenty minutes break. You can drink some outside. Have a talk with some of the. Uh, students here or have a talk between uh, other people here attending um, and then we'll come back at three yes everyone is uh, is back <laughs> but uh, I'll, I'll begin anyway so uh, normally i should have like a cameraman because now this one is a uh, is I'm using camera, but uh, it didn't work with a cameraman. But I'll I'll camera my camera man myself here. Camera, but they, yeah, it will work. So yeah, welcome uh, welcome back uh, to our uh, seminar, um, and I'll be of course the next speaker um, presenting opportunities of virtual reality for chemical lab safety. Um, you probably would uh, ask yourself like. Why is this dude he wearing headsets? Um, then I would say, why the hell not? <laughs> I mean, at least not seeing you helps against my onstage anxiety, right? So uh, no, the the real reason is that I 
can really show you the um, the potential of uh, virtual reality by by showing it like this. Um, yes. Oh, maybe maybe uh, Sercon. Uh, you can also uh, you can also uh, come into environments. That that'll be okay. I think I think this will be fine. So yeah, uh, while Sercon um, sets up his one, I'll show you first what is actually virtual reality. Then I'll point into this uh, side. Then we'll spawn this one. What is virtual reality? Um, well, as Jessica said, uh, with augmented reality, you have um, you have like a, a real world background, and then the digital uh, world is then projected onto that real world. But in virtual reality, everything is um, is simulated uh, like this. So. Um, Usually, when when I go on the talking to friends, talking to people, like I say, uh, "Hey, have you tried uh, virtual reality before?" And they say, "Oh yeah, um, but I didn't like it. Um, it was yeah, it's not my thing. It's just a gimmick, just a gimmick." They said, but yeah, most of the time, those VR headsets they already tried and they don't like it. They're talking about um, Google Cardboard or like uh, Google Daydream View, and those are. Um, three degrees of freedom uh, devices. So uh, let's go more into this part. Can you see this? So this, uh, for example, can you see me grabbing it? This one as well? Can you see me grabbing it? Yeah. Okay. Like this is like, a, I'll, I'll show it even closer. Uh, if, eventually you see also Serkan here uh, joining. Hello. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so you have this. This is a Google Cardboard, and you put your phone in there, and then you see through the uh, through the lenses, and uh, each side of the of the phone displays a different um, different view, um, and then you see like a 3D perception. And because these are headsets, you're totally closed off of the environment and only see the uh, the the uh, the world inside. You cannot see the outside anymore. So that's why it's so immersive. Um, but yeah, and these also this is also like a Google Daydream View uh, remote. But these are three de three degrees of freedom. What does it mean? It only can um, can only see the register the rotation of the devices. So, so only the ro rotation on the three axes. Also for the uh, for the Google day Daydream View, also three D axes that you rotate. But not really the translation uh, parts that you can actually move inside an in, uh, environment. So then um, there's another device which I'm wearing as well, called um, Six Degrees of Freedom. And with Six Degrees of Freedom, you have the rotation part, but you can also move uh, in in VR as well. Like you can, I can actually move. I have a boundary um, normally. Yeah, this is my boundary. They're drawn, so I can actually move inside. I can turn my head, and uh, it feels like I'm literally there. And how does it work? It's because of uh, there's like four. I can wait. Self camera man. Okay. Yes, you see, like you have like four uh, cameras here on the headsets, and this actually tracks the environment and actually tracks your controllers because the controller sends out like a infrared uh, signal and then the, uh, the headset detects it like where it is and also how it rotates. So that's how it actually does. And this is what it's called uh, inside out tracking. There are some other devices that have like a, um, different kind of systems outside, like uh, some kind of standing pole. But this one, you don't have a, a wire that you need to connect to a computer. And you can just wear it like I am here. So, um, but how does it actually relate to uh, chemical lab safety, right? So then I have been working for uh, three years. Um, wait, I'll point this this word. It's a bit. I've been working three three years on creating a virtual reality training game for uh, chemical lab safety, which is called VR Labo Safe Game. 
and this is actually to teach people uh, yeah, lab safety skills. And I wanted to show you the opportunities that VR has uh, for chemical lab safety. And uh, I'll show you uh, my friend as well, Archie. Yeah, yeah, he's, good. he's a bit bored now, but <laughs> that's uh, the, the, the character that I've also created. But to show you actually the, the, um, the, um, to show you actually the, um, the opportunities that VR has, let's go into the lab because we can do that. It's virtual reality, everything is simulated. Let's go to the virtual lab. Are you coming with, uh, Sircon? Yeah, 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 just, just get in. <laughs> so yeah, pull this. Of course, before entering a lab, you need to put on some safety uh, equipment. Um, Sircon, you also need it if you want to enter, enter the lab. So here I have, uh oh. Yes. I'll put this on. Can you see it? Yeah. I'll put some glasses on. And now, Lou. Um, and some gloves. Because I'm going to experiment some things in a fume hood. I need some gloves to protect myself. Sarkhan, are you also uh, doing it? Same thing? <laughs> Oh yeah, it doesn't register yours. Yeah, but in in his uh, view, he's he's uh, putting on safety. Oh yeah, it does. Cool. Yeah. Now, glasses. Yeah, those are normal glasses. They don't protect you from uh, chemical dangers. Look at me. Yeah. Perfect. Okay, let's enter the lab. Yeah, um, normally I have I have the gloves here, but uh, you cannot see it, I think. But it's a little bug. But anyway, I, I remove the glove, one glove to pull on the on the on the door. Should it as well with the, the, the hand with no glove. And then we uh, this is the virtual lab. Like you see, it's like a, it's like real. You have some fume hoods here. You have some benches here. You have some uh, cabinets here where you put uh, some products. And here you can also see like uh, some products here, which are, um, okay, Some someone left uh, their <laughs> lab book note here. But yeah, this is actually like a real uh, realistic laboratory. Uh, you have everything that you need, but uh, the, the, yeah, the, the, the good thing here in VR is that you can actually teach um, situational awareness and safety awareness because in a lecture when you uh, when you have like a class and you can do not you, uh, you shouldn't do this or you shouldn't do that uh, you don't actually learn situationally like in that moment like uh, on the lab itself because when you're working you don't think of uh, that that's yeah you should think as fast like you shouldn't do that but um, sometimes you just into the, the into the, the, the work uh, mindsets and you probably don't see it, but in VR you can actually train that because you're inside a real lab and then um, what you do is actually pretty safe because I don't have any real chemicals right here, right? But in VR I have. So let's say here I found a, I found a risk here. So in the game, VR lab or safe game, you can, um, can, you need to find some lab safety risks. Uh, like this one is a fume hood that's too open so then in the game I would take a I would take a picture of it. Take a picture. And then on the tablets they would there would be some questions about the hazards. Can you see the can you see the questions? Yeah. So uh, what hazard type uh, are present in this photo? Health, physical, environmental, or failure of preventive equipment. I would say uh, health, because this one is corrosive. Like what is this chemical actually? Uh, ammonia. Ammonia, a coy solution. Yeah, it's also it also uh, stinks. Like it it actually affects your nose. So then I said health and failure of, of protective equipment because it's it's open. I mean it should be closed. Then next question is, can you see this? Yeah. Uh, what are the possible consequences of this risk? The hot plate can ignite chemicals on fire. No, it's just an ammonia solution. 
uh, insufficient ventilation causes inhalation problems. Yeah, it's open. It doesn't ventilate anything. Chemical splashes can reach the body easily. Yeah, because it's open. It can reach the body. And then insufficient ventilation can create uh, an explosive atmosphere. No, because there's not really explosive there or flammable. So, so I pick those two. Uh, submit. I close this one. Whoop. Okay. And then there's like a risk panel showing what I've uh, pointed out, like what is wrong, and then the, the safety information also on it. So yeah, that's that's how the game actually works. You can actually um, track, um, like try to search for uh, safety risks, trying to minimize them, um, and uh, have like this kind of hazard identification and risk assessments um, skill that you train. But then also the, the big cool thing is that if you do something wrong, you don't get affected in, in real life, but you do af get affected in, uh, in virtual reality. So here, here this one I have is a nitric acid. And this, uh, this ton is like uh, alkaline inorganic liquid waste. So that's base. And if you add acid to base, you know what happens, right? It will explode. Uh, if you do it very fast, like ah. so in VR, I'm affected like, oh, I'm, I'm, uh, my health points are down. But in real life, I'm pretty safe. So that's that's also a big, very nice thing to have in VR for chemical lab safety. But also, not only that, you can also do like experiments in VR. So here I'm trying to set up a distillation column, distillation setup, and I'll do it like a speed running uh, because I, I know how to do it, but uh, I'm running out of time. So then I'll grab this V curriculum, put it in. Oh, yep. I'll pick this one and that. I'll put it inside here. Then I need this and that. Yep. So I'm uh, kind of speed running this, but I don't do it as don't do it in real life in the lab. You can uh, have some uh, something uh, wrong. Up, up. Some kick clips to uh, adjust it. Up. Like this and these two things as well. Up. Like this. And then run the roller. Normally should be running. And that's it. That's a. Uh, that's a distillation, a simple distillation setup. But you can actually do that in VR. And uh, that's so cool because uh, when I was a student in, in Ugent, I also like um, learned how to do this, but in real. And now I'm doing it in VR, which is very realistic as well, how um, I would do it. So this is one of the, those are the three uh, main things that you can actually do in VR that uh, in, in real life, it's pretty uh, dangerous to do. And then, the main thing as well, you can have a different people inside the same environment. So actually, hello. <laughs> so yeah, if we have the big other opportunity of VR is that you can have like collaborative uh, ways of uh, setting up experiments and uh, and doing all these stuff with more people and collaboratively. So that those are the real opportunities of VR. It's like a virtual new world uh, where you can do stuff but really safe. And um, I think I'm done. Are there any questions? Um, I'll just, uh, where, where are you? Maybe you can, oh, there. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, the microphone should be somewhere there. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's, that's how it looks. We have uh, five minutes. Uh, hi, uh, very impressive, a very nice uh, something that you developed. Yeah. I got maybe a, a, a little strange question, okay. but um, any any question is fine. There's, there's no strange question. Yeah, it's, it's something about uh, the sexes. You always show a, f a male uh, yeah. <laughs> person. It's always, always like that because <laughs> it's quite well. I know that some students find it very important that the yeah, size yeah. is also something about females about women. 
So it's something that you, you take into account? or Definitely. In the game, you can actually um, adjust your own character. Be a female with pink hair or a guy with pink hair. Uh, doesn't matter. You can adjust yourself, uh, just your own avatar in the game itself. Um, but for this purpose, I just use one standard person. That's me, um, because it's uh, easier to uh, put it put it into uh, this kind of yeah. similar way. It's but just, it's just not one image that is used because we we did see the same image of a person. You can choose what you are. Female or male? Yeah, 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 yeah. You can, can okay. in the game you can change it, but okay. uh, for this uh, seminar, I just use the same. Yeah, person. it's no problem. It's just yeah. something I, I thought about. Sorry. It's cool. It's cool. But that's a cool question because now with um, collaborative metaverse, everyone can actually be whatever they want. They can be a bunny. They can be a, um, yeah, um, they can be like a giraffe um, working in a lab, whatever. But with the uh, lab protection as well. And so they have to, you know, they have to adjust to giraffe size. But um, anyway, <laughs> yeah, so you can actually be whatever you want uh, in this uh, kind of digital virtual world. Any other questions? There's another question. Um, will this be a game available to anyone who wants to play it at home, not not just um, for school and stuff? Um, in the future, well, now is you can if you have the uh, Oculus Quest, you can just run the game anywhere. You can do it in the on the boat, even so, whatever. Um, but for now, the application is um, only for research and charming consortium, and we are still like dis discussing um, a bit how we could actually distribute this kind of applications to other. Uh, other people, but there's a lot of complications because you need to have maintenance, like uh, you need to re, re uh, update um, frequently and uh, you need to update the, the application frequently. And if I don't work at, yeah, I wouldn't work at Charming anymore. I wouldn't be working on this uh, application. So yeah, there's there's a, still some this discussion of how do we actually distribute it to, to other people, but um, yeah, hopefully I can actually distribute one version of the game because um, maybe I will work on it later on in my future career, but I cannot say for certain um, for certainty right now. Okay, hi, Philip. Um, I also have a question. Um, we, you, you said maintenance because this this environment is developing so fast and quickly. Yeah. For your particular application, what are the what would you see solved as soon as possible like we as see. soon as possible yeah what do you think is still a limitation um, you... yeah for now like the uh i had the so the the missions of uh finding risks and minimizing these risks these are already developed you can already do that but like the uh, experimental thing like the distillation setup i can do it but there's still some bugs inside so i for like the next version, I would have that fixed, uh, so you can actually play the uh, the distillation ex um, experiment with some hazards that uh, that appear if you do something wrong. Um, but focus on the immersive part. So, what is can be more realistic? What what is still more realistic? Yeah, if I would have like a better uh, developing team, let's say, then the graphics would be uh, better. But uh, because these are just plain colors, uh, no no real texture, um, and also the complexity. There's a lot of things that can actually um, be better because this is just a prototype for the um, mm -hmm. um, for the project. But yeah, there's a lot of things that can be uh, adjusted. Let's see. But um, yeah, for my research wise, is is um, uh Let's see. Okay, yes, I think my time is up. So uh, thank you for being uh, <laughs> being audience of this kind of experiment for me as well. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go to the next speaker. I'll uh, put this off. Wait, how do we do this again? Yeah. Good. Ooh, yeah, I'm back. Yes, and the next speaker will be Sonne van Loonen. 
um, yeah, you, you didn't upload your. Um, Hello, everyone. Uh, so my presentation will be uh, more traditional than this really nice presentation that Philip gave. The only thing I'm waiting till it actually is there. So one moment. No servers. OK, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Sanna van Luna, and I'm also part of Charming, and I'm part of the, the first work package where we look at how to create enthusiasm uh, among children. And I'm doing that more from a technologies perspective. And actually what I'm looking into is like how we can use VR to actually bring chemistry experiments in a safe way in primary class school classrooms. So that's what I will talk to you about, or more specifically, I will talk to you about the setup that you see here in this picture behind me, because that is what we are currently developing. And I will yeah, explain to you what it actually is and how we came to that, um, to that setup. So it actually all started with, well, when I was a student myself, I helped out a couple of times during um, outreach activities. This was more specific into physics because that is what I have studied. But when we were at these outreach activities, we noticed that people are very enthusiastic when you show them like this very crazy experiments. And yeah, we want to actually see if we can use these type of activities and bring them actually to the classrooms. However, that's not very easy to do because well, most of the time you need the resources. Um, it can be quite messy if you really want to have big reactions and big explosions. It can be dangerous and that's something you don't want to have. And you can actually not let the children themselves perform the experiments. It's always the teacher that needs to actually show uh, yeah, what those experiments do. However, as Philip already nicely explained in his last presentation, VR is something that could help us with it because it creates presence, immersions. It really gives you the feeling as if you're really in, in, in the environment yourself and that you can do the experiments yourself without actually getting hurt. And you can basically do the experiments as many times as you want because something happens, it explodes, there's a lot of mess, you just press on a button and the, the environment completely resets. You also can include instructions, which might be very helpful for the teacher because they don't have to stand next to the children and yeah, tell them what they need to do. And you can also show alternative perspectives. So what I mean is that you can only not show the macroscopic scale, but you can really zoom into it. However, VR itself has also limitations and not only talking about the costs, uh, the costs are going down more and more, but or the motion sickness that sometimes can happen when the environment is not well designed. But I'm mostly also thinking about the more practical aspects. So if you have the VR headset on your head, if it's not well mounted on your head, it can be, yeah, not be comfortable because the, the images cannot be very clear. You also need space. Um, as Philip, as you saw, with Philip, he was walking around, but some people can be so emerged that they just run into the wall. And that's also not something that you don't want to happen. Um, and other than that, the teacher itself needs to have the technology um, knowledge because the, the students will probably be new to that and they need an introduction. If you need to do that for 20 students at the same time or individual, it will be very time consuming. And something I also heard is that it's individual because everybody has a headset on their head. So what I'm doing in my research is to see how can we well, still use the advantages of VR, having this safe environment, while minimizing these limitations as much as possible. So based on yeah, our experiences with both VR and the outreach activities, we came up with the following design of using VR, and it's basically by not placing the VR headset on the head, but more in a setup. So this is like a physical box, with the VR headset on the side so that you avoid to put it 
um, on the on, on the hats. It's also in a way that the people just will just walk by, look into it, put their hands into the box and actually perform the experiments. And then if they are finished, the next stu students will go. So over the past year, I've been continue developing this to actually going from this sketch to actually something that we can test. So this is how it looks like. It's currently an uh, aluminium frame because we really want it to be sturdy that we can really place it in the, 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 um, the, the classroom and that not be the first time that the, the children interact with it, that it will fall apart. Um, and you see that the VR headset is mounted inside the wall um, attached to the aluminium frame. And then the, the sides are cardboard slides or, or cardboard um, plates that can be just sliced into the aluminium frame and that you can customize it the way you want it and to really give it like some kind of feel of yeah baby a few moods. Um, so this is now how it looks like from the outside. Of course you also need to show something on the inside to really give them the idea that they can do experiment. Um, and that's something I've been developing together with Michael de Men, the first speaker of today. And um, when you look at the, the criterion of the curricula, in Belgium, children will learn in the primary school mostly about uh, material properties. So we wanted to do something about material hardness, but we also wanted to do something that you were not able to do in real, uh, in real life. So we decided that we would give them a hydraulic press to test different materials and to see which one is more squeezable than, than not. And this is actually how you look at how it looks like. You see, the, you see the virtual hydraulic press. You have a handle which you can pull the, the upper part down. And you have different materials that you can test. And if you put it all together, this is how it looks like. So on the left hand side, you see an image of inside the, the, the physical setup. Here you see an image of what actually will happen in Inside the VR, this is what the, the player sees. Also note that um, I actually can use my hands uh, for interacting with the virtual environment. So Philip has controllers and we specifically decided to go for a technique, technique that you don't use them. But if you have, because if you have 20 students coming, passing by, this is a high, risk is high that the controllers will break, will lose or that the batteries will drain. So this is how it then looks like. So you have the material, you put it on the press and then you can test it. Um, and then based on how easy it will be to squeeze, it will be harder or softer. So this was the first version that we made. It's also the very first version that we uh, tested with children. Um, so I want to, to show you a bit what we observed there. Um, so I think last year six children uh, came by at the Gay Leuven to provide their feedback about the setup. Um, for us it was an, an interesting test to do because well it is a completely different way than which you than as you would normally use VR as it's really stationary. And interesting all children did not seem to have problems. So they were able just to sit there to play with the environment. And also there were not very unexpected interaction, which is always very nice as a developer uh, that something something works and that yeah, users can are very creative in break, breaking things. However, um, there were also some difficulties that we, that we observed. For example, the hand tracking, it's, it's very new with the Oculus Quest. Um, and I really explained to them how they needed to interact with it. But even after the explanation and after practicing, uh, they still needed to have constant reminding of how they needed to interact with it. So that is something that really needs to improve. Uh, the children also had this trouble with distinguishing the hardness um, or also recognizing it. So we noticed that for the hardest material that you cannot squeeze at all, that they became a bit frustrated because they didn't know what it actually meant. Um, so that was something that we need to improve and the VR headset was at this point too high because we mostly tested with adults and yeah children are of course much smaller than adults and that also meant does something different is that the interaction space which is very limited in our uh, setup that it was actually more limited than we expected. Um, so 
directly after this user test, we did a second test where we tried to focus more on this specific points to see if we could improve that. So um, we tried to get a bit more distinction between the, the different material hardness. So we added extra materials that the children can test. So you can see that in the image above. Um, we also made the materials bigger in size so that this difference in, in, in uh, pressing speed would be more pronounced. Uh, we gave more visual feedback where that you cannot push them um, all the way, but that the harder the material, that the more less squeezed it is. Um, and we also gave the material sounds. To make the grab easier, we give visual indicators so that if the system tells you that you can grab something, that you will also see that with a blue hand. And if you have grabbed something, that there would be a blue outline. Um, and we improved the VR headsets positioning and also the mounting. Um, then from the second test, those were also positive because it seemed that there were improvements. So four out of five, five children were able now to correctly arrange the materials and to, to distinguish it. So that was a big improvement. Although uh, one thing we noticed now, so I, I gave always instructions, but I wanted to test out like, okay, if you just give, set them in the environment, you, you make sure that they see everything. They were not able to connect that what they saw in the environment, that it also meant that they knew what they needed to do. So definitely additional instructions are needed. Um, so though they perceived the hardness correctly, uh, they were Another thing that they mentioned was that the arrangement in the materials was more difficult um, and that the, the object interaction was more, was improved. As in, I didn't need it to remind them every time, but it's still something that can be more easier done. And yeah, luckily for the physical side, everything worked. So um, it's mostly now the, 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 the virtual environment where we need to have improvements. So that is also what I'm currently working on. So the setup works. Um, the initial tests were positive, but we need to further develop it to include, for example, the object arrangement, to include the instructions, but most importantly, to, to improve the grab interaction so that that can be interactable without too much explanations. And that is also what I'm currently working on. So these are for now the next step to actually have something that can be embedded in a, a larger class activity so that we can, in the end, really test it in a classroom to see if our design really makes VR more feasible in a classroom environment. And that is my presentation. Oh, first, I would like to also give some acknowledgement because I have not been able to do that without all these amazing people. And also the technical workshop, the KLUVE helped me a lot, and uh, the Lucas team, where I've been working also in the past years. And yeah, with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, let me know. You can always also send me a mail, and hopefully I can, is this the first step that to make children as enthusiastic as these players to do experiments? And that's it. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sonne. Does anyone have any questions? You can actually post them right now instead of uh, um, email Sonne. Yeah, uh, <laughs> if there are questions yeah. later, you can always ask me. <laughs> any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah. yeah, you mentioned that in the second uh, exam, uh, in the second study, you had to give guidance to children. But my question is, could this guidance be included inside the game itself? Yeah, so that is indeed one of the things that we're looking at. Um, the, uh, we want to, yeah, there are two ways. So as we're currently doing the setup, we will give the guidance outside because it takes some more time to actually do that inside the environment. Uh, but definitely that was one of the ideas to have, for example, starting scene. That's step for steps, let the children um, yeah, introduce with all the, the different interaction that they need to use. Mm -hmm. And then based on that, that they need to, um, yeah, do the experiment. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks a lot. Yeah. Nice work. Um, mm -hmm. You talked about five students. What was the background of the five students? Did they have IT experience or? No, so it was primary. Um, it was pretty 
um, brought? Because there were some that really were into gaming and you really saw that. Because they, gamers, they really go into a game and they start to do everything. You don't have any time to explain, you just need to let them go and, and um, let them do their thing and figure it out. But there were also definitely students who were more or less sure that they really sit there and were more waiting for instructions. Um, so yeah, I think broad background, um, also science-wise broad background. There was one person who was who was the son of a an, an physics professor. You know, he, he knows more about physics and atoms while others were just like completely new new concept. Yeah. Uh, you want to you want to test in the classroom. Uh, you know that in the classroom a lot of different uh, pupils are, 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 are there in the classroom. Mm -hmm. They have special needs sometimes. Uh, how do you think that uh, uh, a student twist of a a child with autism will react? That's a good question. Um, I don't know. And I also have not thought about it yet. But for now, we really also try to design it in such way that it's not too overwhelming, the environment itself. Um, and also that it's like very accessible. And that's why I really like we, we first need to pinpoint the interaction before we actually going to start um, testing in classrooms, because if you know beforehand that there will be some problems, yeah, then it might be already very difficult. Yeah, um, but yeah, I don't know how our children with autism would react. Uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any literature about it. I don't know. So. Yeah, they're probably because VR actually over the last years mostly also used with regard to medical interventions, psychological disorders, and I think it's also been used with autism. So there should be somewhere some literature about that. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I would also think that would be a whole different research and different PhD even. Yeah. It's not it's out of your reach at least. <laughs> <laughs> Any other question? Yes. I also like this very much. What is the next step? So that th this is kind of physics you're doing, eh? the, 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 the pressing. So you want to like make a chemistry set? That, be, that children can mix chemicals and see the reactions, or is that too? Um, yeah, so for now, I really thought about it because I think that is, you know, the, the fun yeah. thing to do, right? Because it doesn't exist anymore. In the 60s, you could buy chemistry sets for children yeah. that contain cyanide and percolates, <laughs> but now they, they don't allow you to buy it anymore. So true, true. Yeah, I, I would love to do that. The only thing is that with now with the classroom activity, we ourselves are going to focus more towards materials properties. So unfortunately, no liquids to put to each other and, and blow apart. Um, one thing I do would like to test is uh, the Bunsen burner, that they need to burn something. Mm -hmm. so, color, yeah. yeah, so in that way, that maybe still there will be, yeah, that's something you cannot do in a classroom, but it is something that I think it's common to, to show experiments, yeah. If it never goes to the chemistry set, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe the last question. Mm -hmm. Hello, um, is there an idea to make a physical lever or is that impossible to implement implement in the VR? No, it is uh, definitely possible. Uh, we specifically do not choose to do this because, well, and then this will be a PhD on its own also to have this extra. On the other hand, um, we want to make it as accessible for schools as possible and reduce as much external like smaller objects in there and this would be like an extra object that could break that could yeah that you will lose that maybe give some technical challenges so that's why we want to reduce that as much as much as possible yeah uh yeah small question yeah yeah i hope is that enough yes yeah okay yeah that's quite important it has to reach the the schools how you're gonna reach the schools because can yeah. they buy something like this but by in your lab or how do you? Yeah, so uh, that's actually also an interesting question. Um, we are thinking about it a lot. So for now, it's really a prototype. Um, and for me, like to have it in this classroom activity is one way because I want to test it. Or the other way, at the K Leuven, they have like um, this um, boxes that they make available to schools. 
Yeah, the innovation lab. And I would love this to be like an activity that would be part of the innovation lab. And that in that sense, it can be lent to schools. Also, I think it would be interesting to make the experiments itself available. But yeah, not every, every school has a VR headset. If you have VR headsets, you need to make sure that they're up to date. And then this would all be managed by the, the, the k Leuven. Um, but that would be my dream, <laughs> if that would be fun. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Also, small remark uh, from the question from this, sir, um, that the technology now from the Oculus Quest cannot track uh, external objects to be part of uh, the virtual world, but that would be, I think, the next uh, next generation of VR that you actually have physical things that you can grab, that you put inside this kind of, kind of camera that it detects that that is something that I can put inside a VR. But uh, yeah, we are still limited um, technically wise. This see hands, yeah. It's only in the hands that they now can track yeah. with the Oculus, with the MetaQuest 2. Okay, up to uh, the next and last speaker, uh, Serkan Solmas. Floor is yours. I'll uh, switch to your presentation. Oops. Hello. Please. So hello everyone. Welcome to the last presentation. Uh, my name is Serkan. I am a PhD student at K11 Chemical Engineering Department, and I am also a part of Charming Project. And today I am going to talk about my research, which is kind of uh, different than what you have seen more in the engineering side. And here I am trying to teach. Uh, fluid dynamic simulations with immersive learning tools. And I will come in the next slide what it does mean. This guy, uh, it was me in 2013 when I was first introduced simulations. It was a complex environment with a computer. You should know about mathematical science, chemistry, physics, and also computer science. So it's a complex learning environment. And by using this kind of simulations, we solve uh, fluid dynamic problems, for example, mixing two liquids inside the reactor by using physics-based simulations. So you should really know physics, chemistry, and also computer science. So I was completely puzzled that time, and I was like, okay, what, what it does, what it means. And when I went to the lectures, and they are like, okay, this is a complex thing, and it's complicated. And the question was, okay, it's complex, but should it be complicated? So after 10 years, almost, I try to find some answers and some solutions to make this guy happy by using immersive learning. And currently, while I'm doing some uh, experiments, people are smiling, so I think I'm reaching to that guy. <laughs> so what I am doing, I am using immersive learning, which means that I use immersive uh, technologies with pedagogical guidelines to create more user-friendly simulation environments. So that way we can teach simulations challenging concepts in chemical engineering, like for instance, mixing in chemical reactors, and making like more challenging, we call it process intensification processes. So this is my research and what I do, I create this integration, like using this software in immersive tools, like the simulation software, and also I create immersive learning uh, experiences for university students. What I do in the end, uh, I blend these two, three different disciplines. I use computational fluid dynamics as a simulation tool, as a content that we accurately create after I create immersive, immersive learning experiences by using technologies and pedagogical guidelines. And this is today's outline. First, I will give you a theoretical framework, how we approach in this, in this project. Then I will talk about our methodology and the implementation we met. Then I will simply show you some prototypes, like proof of concepts with some preliminary user assessments. And afterwards, I will give you some takeaways. So what is theoretical framework here? Basically, we have three disciplines, technology, content, and pedagogy. And according to EU, there are several plans and actions published, I think, starting from 2011, and currently they're also coming out. So EU wants us to use high-performing uh, learning tools, considering augmented and virtual reality. And when we go to the literature and uh, looking at the frameworks, there are already some guidelines. They are calling the TPAC and SAMR, how like uh, a content can be used with engineer, a content can be can be used with technology in education. So I think in the literature you can find several guidelines can be somehow diverted to these ones, but this is I think I will say the two main guidelines that I found, and what it basically says those guidelines they say yeah if you want to create uh, this kind of high performing engine learning tools, we need to uh, work together engineers uh, people from informatics and uh, educational scientists, 
So this is what we are doing in the charming project, bringing different kind of disciplines in the same environment. And in my concept, uh, we tried to yeah, find a foundation at first within the theoretical framework, and afterwards I made my own concept here. We would like to use computational fluid dynamic simulations in education. Why? Engineers use this application in their design and analysis work workflows. We can create accurate content, which means that if you have a research content, you can directly implement it in the education. So this can be a connection from research to education. Um, they are visual, visual and meaningful. We have 3D data geometries, so there are a lot of things to see in the spatial domain. And also data is there, it's digitally adapted. From the immersive technology part, it's generally user friendly to make it more uh, available for students, more accessible. In the meantime, we can also activate these cognitive and behavioral advantages within the immersive tools. So this is a reason that we have chosen. And coming from the pedagogy, I think this is one of the striking part in this research. Instructional design, we found that it's really important because we can really align a learning environment by target groups. In the meantime, we can use evidence-based data, for example, cyber sicknesses created by VR. By using this kind of uh, evidence-based data, we can optimize learning environment. And in the meantime, we can make it target group oriented. But there are challenges. That's why I'm doing this research. First, the studies interdisciplinary. You need expert knowledge from different fields to make it happen. Afterwards, development of these apps and the maintenance. You can create one tool that can be used for a month, but if you want to create something lifelong or at least like a couple of years, it should be maintained in a good way. So I'm trying to uh, also create this kind of uh, maintainable tools. And final assessment, okay, we create a tool, we use different disciplines, but how should how we should undertake this research? What kind of constructs, for example, should it be like self-efficacy behind? What kind of construct from students also we should measure? So this is also the last challenge which I have been currently working on. Now I am talk, I'm going to talk about the methodology that I have been following. Basically, there are no guidelines about this kind of integration, so I try to create a guideline for myself, at least uh, like a system architecture, how I can create a tool, an educational tool with simulations and immersive technology. I also try to uh, somehow condense it to the software architecture. For example, I put like some indicators. Okay, you can create something, like you can put data in VR and student can learn. But if you want to change something, you want to create, like, I don't know, a new reactor, a new reactor in simulation parameter, that time either you should recreate everything, which is quite redundant, or you can just make a remote connection and update the data. So this is what I try to discover here within these two-way connections between different elements in software architecture. And finally, we also put the system requirements, target and like kind of a digital driven approach, because we can basically connect everything and create really like high performing digital environments. So we also try to make it towards digital activity approach. And I made two, three different implementations in this, uh, based on this uh, methodology. First was the uh, integration of data. We got the simulation data from an engineering application, but you, using this data in the AR VR, it was challenging because these are different data formats. So we come up with a data processing pipeline. Then we also work on this data integration, like the data connection and the remote update because we want to create something at least like five or six year people can use in the classrooms or in the universities. And for that, if you have one case study, it's okay as a use case, but if you want to create another like simulation experience, there should be some connections, which will be also easier for lectures, you can assume. And finally, I work on the pedagogy and learning theory. Yes, we have AR, VR immersive tools, but what kind of instructional design methodologies that we should apply them in order to make them more user and educational friendly. And in the last part, I work on the pedagogy and learning theories. Now I will talk about prototypes and give you some uh, proof of concepts that I have so far developed. Before coming to that, I want to talk about the learning theory, what I have done. So simulations generally, they are complex environments and basically engineers, they are solving problems and it requires critical thinking. It requires like creative problem solving. So you should really give that sense like why we need simulations because normally there are experiments out there or handbooks, but we use simulations. So it's, ki it's kind of complicated. So this should be properly explained to students. And in the traditional settings, it's happening by learning by doing as I had in, 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 in the past. They just give me the software. They said, okay, learn it. Okay, but there is no materials. You are just giving me a software. What should I do? You are just goggling. You are just trying to talk with uh, peers. So it's really like a iterative and challenging uh, learning procedure. And according to learning uh, educational scientists, this is not the efficient way to teach something. So diving into the literature, 
as an engineer, it was really hard to understand what is yeah, cognition for me like age because I am like a pure engineer. So I really went into pedagogy and tried to understand what kind of instructional methodologies that I can use in order to make engineering simulations more uh, educational friendly. So I come up with two different instructional design methodologies here for different technologies based on my targets. For inquiry-based learning approach, we use for augmented reality because in the AR, we want them to solve a twist with simulation results. So what we do, we have the data available. It's a 3D data. They can observe with their mobile phones. We provide some instructions and with an iterative way, they learn, for example, you want to teach them turbulence, but with this, we start with the laminar flow and progressively, iteratively, they learn they are approaching through the turbulence. In the second one, we use co four components instructional design methodology. Here we, com we target complex and uh, holistic learning because in the simulations, as I told you, there is an engineering methodology. We cannot start with, okay, I'm going to do a simulation and solve this problem. It's not working that way. At first, you are having a methodology. You are thinking of what kind of solutions you can come up with and the methodologies like experimental, numerical, or theoretical. So we want them to learn this kind of like complex holistic engineering procedure. And for components, instruction, instructional design methodology gave a very good uh, insight there how we can align this holistic environment in VR. So we choose uh, for CID in the design of VR environment. And finally, yeah, we think that it's, it's going to be easier for students. At least they will be, maybe they will not learn more, more than the traditional settings, but they will be more motivated and maybe they will not give up. They will not abandon uh, in the, in the when first time they see simulations. This is the augmented reality application I developed, I think, two or two years ago. But this was for data exploration, how I can integrate data in the AR. This is also available on Google Play. So here, what you see on a table, for example, like some printouts, when they scan the code with their mobile phone, they see some simulation data, and this is a, a, mix, a mixer, a, react, a chemical reactor, where you can mix some different kind of fluids. And here, for instance, we want them to learn uh, or optimize the uh, rotational speed by changing and playing with some parameters. So we give them a twist, like a problem, to complete the fixtures, and we want them to solve it in using AR something simplistic but uh, accessible and make simulations more user friendly we can basically create any kind of experience like air flow around k11 object they can see how in the real life air can flow and also making different kind of interactions by using very cheap and dirty ar features on the other hand i do also develop vr which is also currently a case that i am running a user studies here the idea is to create a holistic environment because for the simulation data, there are a lot of prior knowledge is required. They should really know about physics and the chemistry if it, it's in. So we created the conceptual garage, which is called virtual garage. And here we want them to solve yeah, real life engineering problems with simulation data. But how it happens, so before coming to that, I will a bit explain what it does mean. So we have 15 case studies in this, up in this garage because in the end, we want to teach really challenging engineering uh, applications like mixing with ultrasound, really like we are like we are using in the in the in the uh, in intensive part of research, but we are starting with the simple part. So we created a storyline here, verse, verse, which is starting with a simple case study, and we gradually increase the complexity by using different uh, cases. We use for CID in the design of instructional design. We also apply kind of gamification. We put some playful tasks, and also there is an engineering role playing game. Then there's an instructor in the app, and we call we call students engineers. So there are some stakeholders, some collaborators. So you learn how to solve a problem in engineers in the industry. And the headset that I use is like Philip and Sinai's Oculus Quest 2. For example, this is one of the case studies in which uh, students learn how to mix uh, liquid soap. And I call it holistic. Why? Because when I do experiments, I see a lot of students, they don't know how to use VR because we don't have this kind of tools at home. So I want to create really like a package. We just deliver it to students and they learn something. So here for that, I come up with the three modules. First is a pre-training module in which we teach virtual reality inside virtual reality. So they come up in VR and they learn how to interact with the objects and how to complete the tasks. Then they come into theory, and in the theory part, we give the basics of the problem. For example, one setting is like chlorination. They, they try to uh, disinfect bacteria in this, uh, for example, water channel. And in the theory part, before coming to simulation, they learn about the chlorination, what it does mean and how it can be applied, and how we can design a channel as an engineer to make more safe water processing. 
And finally, we create again a twist in the theory part. And when they come to the simulation part, they solve the problem by using simulation data. And this is some, some, somehow a replica, a, replica, a replica of engineering methodology that we apply in the industry. I recently run a user assessment to see this application, how it can be grasped by students. So I will show you some uh, preliminary results. Uh, I did a pilot test before with seven uh, participants at Leve here in the Graduate School of Chem Chemical Engineering in November, December. And recently I ran the first test in order to measure usability, user experience, and also saw some self-reported questionnaires about content and technology. I got 24 students from KE Leve, again, Graduate School. And I will be talking about test one. Before coming to test one, what kind of data uh, that I collected? At first, I collected their demographics and experience and interest before coming into the VR. Afterwards, they came in VR and uh, they did the first part with test preliminary training and theory around 20 minutes. And afterwards, they answered some standard questionnaires. Then we had a five minutes break. And afterwards, they come into the second part and they solved the problem by using simulation data. And after again, they answered questions and also we got some more questions to improve our prototype. First uh, results about the system usability scale is uh, they call it a dirty scale to understand the system usability in digital devices. And I compare module one, which is like it, some traditional instructions to the module two, which is simulation data requires critical thinking and problem solving. According to the scale, 68 is the threshold and above points above 68, which, does, which means that usability is okay. And for both cases, we have around yeah, more, than, more than 68, which means that they are okay in terms of usability. Students, they didn't have any problem. But what, what we see is that uh, we see some different patterns. For example, so, some of students, 10 of them preferred part one, then to part two, and like different also preferences. So this is a ma matter of experience, or I don't know, like the, maybe any kind of the other uh, preliminary data collection that we can see, but we don't know. So we are doing some data processing right now to see that this pattern work in progress. And in the meantime, I also measured a uh, task load, which is a test from NASA. They use this task load test in order to measure uh, demand in the uh, flight operators when they learn the when they doing these flight simulators. And here, I think it's quite expected when I was in the experiment. Mental demand, for example, I again compared module one or part one to part two. Mental demand is drastically increased because in the second part you should be critically thinking of data and you should solve the problem, which is expected. And this is also kind of reflected into the other demands. And finally, we also assess the simulator sickness because some people can be vulnerable to VR experience. So here again, below 40, which means that VR case is kind of uh, qualified, is safe in terms of cyber sicknesses. And for automatous, if you see the, like, the total simulator sickness, they are below 40 and uh, they are safe. What is interesting here, again, part one and part two, uh, you see the part two, it's, uh, it creates less sicknesses than part one, because in the part two, we have a quite simplified environment with simulation data, so that they don't have to move impact. They just come to the data and they do something uh, easier than the first part. So my conclusion here, instructional design is really important to make it aligned with uh, user experience. Guidelines to reduce VR sicknesses, they worked apparently. We really create an optimal experience there, and we didn't have a major uh, sickness during the experiences. Personalization also is important in the simulation part because working with simulation data requires some uh, personal elements like a graphical user interface and to make some notes, for example. So personalization is important. And in the meantime, also holistic environment, as we see, quite reduced the uh, demand for the uh, external in intervention. And the future work, I will be working on data processing and statistical analysis and I am also having currently another text, the test to measure technology acceptance with uh, task performance. Thank you. That's my research. And if you have any questions, I would like to answer. All right. Thank you, Serkan. Any questions from the audience? Yes. So if I understand correctly, you're evaluating the thing by uh, questionnaires that the students report themselves, what they think about what they did. Yeah. That's not the, probably the best way to assess if a new tool for education is working or not, because uh, students usually don't know if they have learned something well or not. This was the first case, but in the okay, second yeah, case, so I would imagine. it not be 
more fair to kind of compare to another way of instruction, so like more classical or a, a more physical simulation, mm -hmm. and then compare the outcomes, or, or is that too hard to achieve in the... Normally, uh, I have a master's student in Netherlands. She's comparing similar application on desktop compared to VR. So she's still running experiments there, but we are not having yet results. But comparing to traditional settings, I think this is kind of tricky because VR can bring yeah this uh, cognitive advantages and also like making them more motivated. Related to that, is there literature, for example, for you mentioned flight simulator, that's kind of uh, mm -hmm. also an immersive thing. You can do it physically, probably you can also simulate it completely in VR. Mm -hmm. Has that been compared ever? Yeah, yeah, there are literature and basically learning doesn't change that much. There, we can't say that the VR will be better than or superior than to a traditional, but at least they learn it in a, in, a, in a similar way, in a similar fashion. Okay, thanks. Interesting. Yeah, also remark, uh, Serkan has just displayed the user usability of using the VR, but he also he has also a study that actually measures the effectiveness of if people actually have actually learned from their uh, from the from the experience. So, but that's like future. In, uh, it's in the second test, I do pre and post test exactly. to knowledge test. But again, I think in the end, people the question comes like, what about the traditional settings? How I can compare VR to the traditional one? And my question is that should we compare? Because I, uh, this 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 is going to be a supplementary tool. We cannot replace the traditional teaching. So if I, if we can get five more students more motivated or having a lower threshold in the in coming into the simulation environment, I think this will be already helpful. But also, yeah, we wrote a proposal for a master thesis, and hopefully, yeah, we will see her results. So. New thing, <laughs> something new, yeah. Okay, any other questions for Sercon? Hmm? Now online, maybe on the online. Online, is there? Uh, wait. Um, I have to look at the chats. Is there any uh, questions from the chats? Uh, no questions. Nope, no questions. All right, then I'll go to the. Uh, okay, thank you. <laughs> then I'll go to the conclusion slides. All right, so uh, we've seen a lot of interesting talks today, uh, but I'm, I'm showing this uh, presentation to recap, like uh, try to figure out what the main uh, things are from a different uh, kind of speak uh, sp uh, talks, but uh, actually conclude them everything uh, with these following slides. So we've seen from uh, the charming project that we're European project trying to implement immersive learning and trying to support uh, chemistry and chem chemical engineering education and how, uh, for for example, we uh, motivate children to um, to actually um, learn something from from uh, chemistry. And an example of Michael, he had built a, a nice uh, board game that uh, that children can learn from the physical material is actually also inside um, um, elements. Uh, composed out of atoms and bonds. So that's a nice way to actually um, motivate them, but also teach them about the chemical concept of atoms and bonds that they don't usually think about actually if they touch something. Also nice that the children can actually touch something to play and actually have some kind of physical things to actually uh, grab onto because in, uh, in Sonna's version, uh, Sonna he has done developed a VR solution for kids, but VR isn't always uh, the best choice, definitely for children that run around chaotically. And uh, like there's totally different kind of usability than we as adults. So then uh, Sonna tries to have this kind of setup to actually have fixed and um, that actually you just stick your head in and do some experiments, very simple, uh, without actually uh, moving around and bumping your the headset against the uh, against the wall so that's a nice solution for for kids actually so those are great 
uh, solution to motivate children about uh, chemistry and chemical engineering. Then you have the, the second part as well, like educate students because chemical concepts and chemical engineering apps can be very abstract to actually learn from books that actually are not really books. <laughs> so uh, we try to have like this kind of immersive learning and active learning uh, with games, such as in, uh, in Jessie's way, uh, she has like virtual lab um, with AR that you have a titration experiment that you can also do at home actually. Mm -hmm. So people don't have to go to labs, they can just do it at home with actually very nice uh, fidelity of um, doing the transition itself. And even what I find very impressive is that you can do it even with a messy table, like with the laptops here, and you can all still do it actually. So that's, that's pretty nice. Um, then you have Pedro's uh, talk that he uh, kind of integrates simulation software data into a game and trying to actually um, teach like these kind of uh, simulation data and the rules law and more active learning way. And actually funny that active learning is a totally different concept than machine learning and for uh, for active learning as an education. Uh, but that's uh, the struggle that we all have with uh, kind of different terminologies. And then in, uh, in Serkan's uh, way, in Serkan's speech, he uh, talked about complex fluid dynamics data and integrated into VR so that students actually don't see like just numbers and uh, like 2D graphs and, and, and uh, curves, but actually see it physically uh, immersed inside their space. And that actually kind of would integrate their kind of thinking of uh, differently than just looking at the raw data. Um, and also that's, kind of a nice way to educate students um, about chemistry and chemical engineering. And in my case, you actually train employees in VR because VR is very safe and can simulate everything uh, what you can actually think of. And it will be still uh, safe for them to work and actually can actually copy their kind of work uh, simulation. Um, and you can actually see uh, in, in that environment that you wouldn't normally see in the, like a normal lecture. So that's how we try to motivate them to also uh, do lifelong learning while being working, uh, that they also keep learning, keep training inside this kind of environment, uh, that they do their job more safely, better. So yeah, we, these are all the solutions that we've uh, kind of um, made and the immersive technology is so rapidly evolving that yes, even the cardboard is already ancient technology, which um, the cardboard was, uh, or, or the, the, the speed of um, virtual, virtual reality was only like three or, or four years ago. And the, immersive, the technology is so uh, expanding rapidly, um, but we are actually also taking care of that and try to make some nice solutions for uh, chemical engineering education and uh, chemistry education. And I think we all, uh, like all of us uh, speakers, we are not actually um, trained in developing something uh, from IT or we are actually also not really teachers and, and, and um, had uh, educational backgrounds. We are like chemical engineers, chemists, uh, physicists. So we, it's, it's been a really hard challenge for us to actually have this kind of different um, domains uh, and build something quite impressive like this. So um, that's what we've done in, uh, in the project Charming. And um, hopefully we can inspire more people to actually have very different uh, interdisciplinary way to, uh, to work, to learn, to, uh, to live their life actually. So, um, but like all these um, things that you've seen, you can try it out yourself right now. Uh, we go to another location where it's um, more open, um, yeah, even more open, and uh, more TVs, so we can also like probably cast it to the TV. So you can definitely try all all all, all of these stuff, except for the board game, for um, unfortunately because Michael is sick. Um, but if you want to try it, contact him, and uh, he will definitely be um, available. We'll try to make it available to to let you test it. Um, for the people at, at online, uh, unfortunately, you cannot also um, some of these things you cannot really test because yeah, the physical setup of Sunner, for example, you cannot do. 
Um, but we have some kind of solutions online uh, that you can also try it out. If you have the headset, for example, you can try out my uh, game and a demo version, or you can try out um, um, Pedro's game online following that link. Uh, the more lab, you can also try if you have the, uh, the app installed um, so that you can also try it online. But um, yeah, let's go to the, uh, to the next, that, that's the first floor, uh, 0, 0100, and then we can try out some things that we've uh, built. Yes, thank you. All right.